Okay, I think um, these people are already here and then uh, supposed to start at 1.30, but then since uh, I think the room is already full um, and we have to rearrange the extra seat, uh, so I think uh, better for us to uh, start now. So in that case, you know, we can leave the time uh, at the end for, for discussion. So um, again, I would like to welcome you all to uh, the public lecture by uh, Professor Descola, Philip Descola, on the title of Rethinking the Nature and Culture Divide. Uh, the lecture itself is organized by the Institute of Research on Contemporary Service Asia, or IRASE, and the Center for Social Development Studies, or CSDS, at the Faculty of Political Science, Chulalongkorn University. Uh, also, the lecture itself is uh, uh, organized in partnership with the College de France, the Faculty of Political Science at Chulalongkorn University, and also the Siamese Association of Sociologists and Anthropologists of Sasa, and also the French Embassy of Thailand. So, um, with this organization, uh, we uh, now very honored to have Professor Descola with us today. So let me inform you a little bit about the schedule today. So um, now we'll start by uh, having uh, Claire Tran, the director of IRASEC, uh, to welcome, uh, uh, provide you a welcome remarks. And then uh, after that, I will introduce Professor Descola in detail. Um, also, this will follow by the lecture of Professor Descola. And then we have to uh, discuss them today uh, to uh, also, you know, um, we'll uh, be here and then we'll provide some uh, discussion. And at the end, we can have more uh, you know, Q&A uh, uh, before the closing. So without any further ado, uh, I would like to... Um, yes, you can, you can use the, the mobile one. Mobile. Yes. Okay, so uh, please welcome Claire Tran, the, uh, the uh, director of Pyrasek. So I will really be very brief, but uh, as the director of Pyrosec, uh, I'm very pleased to, uh, extremely pleased to welcome Philippe Descola, professor of anthropology of, at the Collège de France, uh, with the uh, Center for Social Development Studies. Uh, initially specialized in the ethnology of the Amazonia, focusing on how native societies relate for their environment, his book uh, are, um, have been translated in many different languages, uh, and in English and in India. Uh, it will be translated into Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. Uh, and so uh, uh, we are very pleased to welcome Professor Descola in Thailand. It's its first time in Southeast Asia. And um, so uh, this conference is the result of close cooperation between IRASAC and Chuan Korn University. IRASEC is a French uh, leading research center dedicated to the study of Southeast Asian region, and we are based in Bangkok. Um, it's a humanities and social sciences uh, center uh, which is working in interdisciplinary and comparative perspective. So this conference is a result of a project initiated by our deputy director Abigail Pesses in, in 2016. And during the uh, world last academic year, she has organized with Jacques Sankhamani and Carl Middleton, and also Stéphane Renaisson, uh, uh, our researcher in Pyrosec. They organized a seminar on the issue of societies and environments in Southeast Asia. The coming of Philippe Descola at Chiang Mai University for a workshop, and then in Chulalongkorn University for this lecture has been made possible thanks to the precious support of the French Embassy in Bangkok. These two academic events with scholars from, uh, uh, from and working on Southeast Asia and Thai scholars in particular is a great opportunity to enrich the debate on the specificities of relationships between natures and cultures in Asia. I would like to warmly thank Professor Naoman Tachun Pon, Director of the Political Sciences Faculty, Professor Chakri Sankhamani, and Carl Middleton, and also the Siamese Association of Sociologists 
and anthropologist Sasa for organizing international forums this lecture. Thank you also to Professor Tanet Von Kernawa and Yukti Mukdavti from Tanasat University for accepting to be the discussion. Thank you. between, on the one hand, 
the biological constraints of human and non-human organisms, and on the other hand, the contingent rules and values of human society. All the concrete objects studied by anthropology are located in this interface between collective institutions and the biological and psychological dimensions which give to social facts their substance but not their form. The rules of kinship and marriage, the way the environment are perceived, used, transformed, technical systems, forms of exchange, ideas about the person, the body and its ailments, ecological knowledge and modes of classifying organisms, all these social practice and know-how that anthropologists study take their source in a wide variety of human physiological functions, anatomical peculiarities, motor schemas, and cognitive abilities, which cannot be dissociated from the cultural forms by the means of which they are expressed. I started my career as an anthropologist 40 years ago by studying precisely this kind of interface between nature and culture. And in a most appropriate setting for such an endeavor, deep in the Amazon jungle of his firm Ecuador. There, together with my wife and fellow anthropologist, I'm Christine Taylor. I spent several years studying the Hibaruan speaking Achua, a small tribe of hunters and uh, Sweden horticulturists who have recently engaged in peaceful contacts with outsiders after several centuries of non peaceful contacts. Using both quantitative and qualitative methods, I uh, undertook to present a thorough description and analysis of the material and ideal relations between this Amazonian society and its environment. At least I was still speaking at the time in terms of society and environment. By contrast with the simplistic determinism of cultural materialism, which was predominant at the time in the field of environmental anthropology, and which purported to explain um, symbolic practices by their sole adaptive role to an ecosystem, I attempted to offer alternative explanations in an alternative conceptual framework. In particular, I showed that although the Atua had long settled in two contrasted um, ecosystems or type of, types of habitat, reef green and intertribal, they did not adjust automatically their social structure and cultural institutions to adapt differentially to the resources potentially av available in the two ecosystems. One of the reasons for this homeostasis was that in both habitats, the food production of the Ashwa widely exceeded their needs while requiring very little labor, approximately between three and four hours a day. I uh, also highlighted the continuum between the garden and the forest in terms of plant manipulation. By constantly transplanting and sparing useful forest species in their gardens alongside cultivated uh, ones, the Achua, generation after generation, had deeply modified the floristic composition of the rainforest. And the result was that the forest, which appeared as wild and 
spontaneous towards the night, as it did to us at the beginning, was in fact the non-intentional result of millennia of human action and transformation of this EU. This in part explained why the Achua did not conceive of the forest as a raw piece of nature to which they had to adapt, but as a collection of personified entities, plants and animals with whom they engaged in daily interactions. I also accounted for the fact that the Achua had refrained from domesticating wild animals, that is, they had refrained from having wild animals produce offspring in domestic settings, while at the same time keeping in their homes a great variety of pets, notably a whole array of uh, mammals, known, on the other hand, to be able to breed in captivity. So it was not a zone technical question. Pets are the byproducts not a, uh, of, of hunting, and they were um, treated with respect as orphans, uh, still under the protection of the powerful spirits ruling the game animals. And this precluded their being owned and controlled by humans. On the basis of a careful revision of the ethnography, I show subsequently that uh, this motivation for the non-domestication of wild animals was equally valid for the rest of the lowlands of South America, as well as for some native hunters elsewhere. Thus, pet keeping was in no way a form of proto-domestication, and it did not lead automatically to domestication as some of us have surmised. But the most important result of this initial fieldwork was probably to make me reconsider the relevance of the great divide between nature and culture as a sort of analytical tool for anthropology, which I've been using myself, which I learned. I started my life as a philosopher, so nature and culture in Western philosophy are central tenets. Uh, I was the student of Claude Lévy Spos, uh, for whom the opposition between nature and culture played also a central analytical role. So I came to the field with this small intellectual toolkit in which the, one of the major, uh, uh, inst major instruments was precisely this division between nature and culture. And of course, revising my view on this, uh, um, it, I was led to do it by the Achuar Indians themselves. Uh, for their day-to-day -day relations, both to humans and to non-humans, were structured by the same two schemes of practice, which is on the one hand predation, and on the other hand domesticity, the two same schemes, uh, uh, schemes of praxis uh, embodied uh, in the opposition between consanguinity and affinity, which are two central categories that are uh, typical of the Dravidian kitchen systems that are dominant in the lowlands of South America. Predation rules both hunting and warfare in such a way that game animals are treated by men as a fine, uh, as a uh, neighboring human groups uh, who are potential enemies. While domesticated, um, uh, or domesticity, let's say, reigns in the gardens, in the Swedens, um, where cultivated, cultivated plants are treated um, by women as consanguines that is, as children um, who need to be nurtured. Thus it was obvious that for uh, the uh, Achua there was a practical and conceptual continuity between the relations with humans and the relations with non-humans. And this ethnographic reappraisal 
challenged, of course, the philosophical notion of nature, so um, important in Western metaphysics and epistemology. For I soon became aware, after doing my fieldwork, writing my dissertation, etc., that uh, such a notion of the opposition between nature and culture was not only equally irrelevant for other Amazonian native populations, but also for most other people the world over. And it led me to discard as Eurocentric the opposition between nature and culture, nature and society, and as a consequence to embark on the task of reconceptualizing what the object of anthropology is in this. I have come now to define this um, object, not the study of the relationship between nature and culture, but the study, the comparative study, of how people go about composing their words. And I would like to devote this lecture to giving some substance to this definition. I think we can safely take for granted a starting point, which is the assumption that humans share the same basic set of cognitive and sensory motor dispositions, and that's what are called usually cultural variations, this is the official term in anthropology, are due not to differences in capacities, but to differences in how salient features of the world are actualized by these capacities. But why is that so? Where does the filtering process come from that selects certain qualities of objects and relations and neglects others as food for thought and vectors of action? The most common answer is that Phenomena are multidimensional. This property is a well-established uh, theme in philosophy ever since Boyle and Locke uh, popularized it as a distinction between primary and secondary qualities. The former primary qualities are said to be intelligible, separable, and in, in a large me measure Calculable, while the secondary qualities are said to be um, the, the, the subject matter of what my uh, master uh, Claude Davis Post uh, called la logique du concret, that is, the ability of the mind to establish relations of correspondence and opposition between salient features of our perceived surroundings. Dealing with those dimensions of a phenomenon where its so-called primary qualities are deemed relevant will most likely result in propositions under a universalist regime. While dealing with the impression it leaves, this phenomenon leaves on our senses, will open up many possibilities for inferences and connections that are related to personal and historical circumstances. Archimedes' principle applies everywhere uh, on Earth, whatever the nature of the body that is plunged into water. What the subjective experience of a human plunged into water may vary considerably according to his or uh, her abilities and according to the context, of course. So this philosophical distinction between the modes of being of the same phenomenon, as they are differentially actualized by various approaches, generated the great epistemological divide between the domain of the sciences of nature and that of the sciences of culture. And the ensuing anathema 
against exporting the method and expectations of the science of nature, which is generalizing, measuring, replicability, prediction, etc., into the methods and expectations of the science of culture. Individualization, interpretation, value sharing, semantic coherence, etc., etc. And vice versa, of course. So the resulting processes of sorting out purification and border policy has made it extremely difficult to deal in practice with the multidimensionality of phenomena as, as these are necessarily dislocated between various forms of expression and various regimes of veridiction. Geology and chemistry, which account for one aspect of the soils I encountered and studied among the Achuar of the uh, upper uh, Amazon, um, while uh, anthropology will account for the, the use the Achuar make of these soils, the names they give to the different types and the myth they narrate about it. So there is a, an epistemological divorce, there was an epistemological divorce at least when I started my career as an introvert. As an introvert. The direction I've been exploring tries to avoid this partialing out of phenomena as a way of explaining the diversity of human perceptions uh, and experiences of their milieu. But there is another reason which uh, explains the very different ways traditionally labeled cultural of giving accounts of the world in spite of a common biological equipment that we all share as humans. Let us call worldly this process of piecing together what is perceived in our media. Here I take worlding in a different sense from the one given to that word by postmodern and postcolonial authors, uh, that is, as a social construction of reality by hegemonic Westerners. I don't take worldly in that sense. By contrast with this meaning, which implies a distinction between a pre-existing transcendental reality and the various cultural versions that can be given of it, a different way of worlding, I see worlding rather as um, the process of stabilization of certain features of what happened to us. Some of you may recognize the definitions that I borrowed from the picture. Now, I surmise that this wording process is not done at random, but it's mainly based on um, upon the basic intuitions as that we form as to the existence and properties of certain beings around us. Why do actual hunters detect spirits when they walk in the forest? Why nuclear scientists do not do so? And you can ask the reverse question. Why uh, do actual hunters do not detect neutrinos when nuclear <coughs> scientists detect them? Questions like this cannot be resolved by opposing, on the one hand, the world as a totality of things, and on the other hand, the multiple worlds of experienced reality, although, although such an opposition between the world as it is and the world as it is subjectively appreciated 
has become the tenet of modernist epistemology. What is potentially available to us as sentient beings is not a complete and self-contained world waiting to be represented according to different viewpoints, but most probably a vast amount of qualities and relations that can be actualized on us by humans according to how ontological filters discriminate between environmental affordances. So the material and immaterial objects of our environment do not stand in the heavens of eternal ideas ready to be captured by our faculties, nor are they mere social constructs giving shape and meaning to a sort of real material that would exist independently of our perception of it. They are just clusters of qualities, some of which we detect, some of which we ignore. And the variety in the forms of worlding comes from the fact that this differential actualization of qualities is not done at random. It follows the line of basic inferences as to how qualities come to be attached to the objects we apprehend and as to how these qualities are related one to the other. So speaking of ontological filters, as I've done, is a way for me to emphasize the fact that the analytical level at which I suggest that the anthropological endeavor should start is more elementary than what is usually taken for granted. My conviction is that systems of differences in the ways humans compose their worlds are not to be understood as byproducts of institutions, of economic systems, of sets of values, of cultural patterns, of worldviews or the like. On the contrary, the latter are the outcome of basic assumptions as to what the world contains and as to how these elements of the furniture of the world are composed and connected. So the word ontology seems appropriate to qualify this analytical level, which could be called in the language of phenomenology, Husserlian phenomenology, ante predicative And my parsimonious use of the word uh, the notion of ontology over the past two decades stands in fact for a claim of conceptual hygiene. Ontology simply means we should look for the roots of human diversity at a deeper level where basic inferences are made about the kind of beings the world is made of and how they relate to each other. Let me now clarify my um, proposition that the variety in the forms of worlding results from the variety of ontological regimes under which this process is realized. Perhaps it would help if I begin by stating very clearly what I think anthropology is about. Its main task, as I see it, is not to provide thorough or thick descriptions of specific institutions, of cultural habits, or social practices. This is the job of ethnography, but not of anthropology. Anthropology can be practiced by ethnographers, and ethnography can be done by anthropologists. I've done both myself. I was there, I was acting as an ethnographer. 
and acquiring inspiration for engaging in anthropological work. But you can't do it at the same time. You can't be, you can't infer anthropological propositions out of mere ethnography for the aims of and methods of ethnography and of anthropology should not be confused. The main task of anthropology is to bring to light how beings of a certain kind, that is humans, operate in their environment, how they detect in this environment or in these and their surroundings uh, such or such property that they make use of and how they ma manage to transform their surroundings by living with it or with, the, with them and between themselves permanent or occasional relations of a remarkable but not infinite diversity and to carry through this task we need to map these relations to better understand their nature to establish their modes of compatibility and incompatibility and to examine how they become actualized in styles of action and thought that appear immediately distinctive. In short, the task of anthropology, again, I want to state it with force, the task of anthropology is to account for how worlds are composed. What are these distinctive styles of composing worlds that anthropology could should and could uh, bring to light. In my view, they uh, should be understood as cognitive and sensory motor patterns of practice, in part innate, in part resulting from the actual process of interaction between organisms, that is, from the practical manners of coordinating human and non-human agencies in a given environment. Such patterns are thus more than framing devices used by the analyst to describe a situation. They are framing devices used by the actors to make sense of a situation and manage the fine-tuning of what could be called interagency. And these framing devices can be seen as abstract structures such as the artificial perspective, for instance, of the routine scenarios of daily interactions which organize skills, perception, um, action without mobilizing a declarative knowledge. They are, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a formula I am fond of quoting. They are, uh, to borrow Morris Bloch's uh, words, things that go without saying. Most of what we study are things that go without saying. That is, the cognitive schemata that regulate habitus, that guide inferences, that filter perceptions, and are large, largely the product, uh, the products of the uh, affordances which the world offer to the specifically human uh, dispositions. The fundamental function of these framing devices is to ascribe identities by lumping together or by dissociating, dissociating elements of the lived world that appear to have similar or dissimilar qualities. My argument is that one of the universal features of the cognitive process into which such dispositions are rooted is the awareness of equality between of planes, not of substances, of planes, between material processes, which I call physicality, 
and mental states, which I call interiority. This assumption is founded on a variety of sources derived from philosophy, from cognitive psychology, and from ethnology, upon which I will not dwell here, although we might return to that in the discussion afterwards. Let me just point out a very basic fact, that until the Western physicalist theories of the late 20th century, what is usually called as a naturalist program uh, in the cognitive sciences and in, in philosophy, until that time, uh, until these theories explain consciousness as an emerging property of biological functions, there was no evidence anywhere of a conception that would describe the normal living human person as a pure physical body without any form of interiority or of a pure interiority without any form of embodiment. <coughs> Thus, the distinction between a plane of interiority and a plane of physicality is not the simple ethnocentric projection of an opposition between body and mind that would be specific to the West. One should rather apprehend this opposition between body and mind as it emerged in Europe and the philosophical and theological theories, theories which were elaborated upon it as local variants of a more general system of elementary contrasts that can be studied comparatively. And by using this universal grid, humans are in a position to emphasize or to minimize continuity and differences between humans and non-humans. An illustration becomes indispensable here, which I will borrow from the rich habit of relations between peoples and birds. The Noongar tribes in southwestern Australia were organized in exogamous moieties named after two birds, the white cockatoo Cacatua Temurostris, whose indigenous name, Marnech, can be translated as the catcher, and the crow, Corvus Coroloides, called Varda, a term meaning the watcher. The fact that an animal species is named after a general characteristic of its behavior rather than by a term exclusively associated with this animal is a feature common in Australian languages and it's partly explained by the status conferred on these two totemic words. They are the origin and substantial embodiment of two contrasting sets of material and spiritual properties, character traits, physical disposition and capacities, psychological tendencies and the like, that are repeatedly peculiar to all human members of each of these moieties and simultaneously to all non-human non-humans respectively affiliated to each of these two totemic grouping. William Spencer and Frank Gillen, great uh, ethnographers, early ethnographers of Aboriginal Australia, noted this continuity of this community of disposition and temperaments within hybrid communities more than a century ago when they wrote that in Central Australia, I quote them, the totem of any man is regarded as the main thing as himself. It is not that the object of this kind of identification is a crow or a cockatoo observable in the environment. 
but rather that these species constitute the hypostasis of the relationship of physical and moral identity between certain entities of the world. A relationship that transcends apparent morphological and functional differences better to emphasize a common base of ontological civility. Far from there, far from Australia, on the plateau of central Mexico, the Otomi Indians also maintain a relationship of identification with birds and primarily with the black vulture. This bird, the scavenger, is the most common avatar of the tona. And the tona is an animal double whose life, whose life cycle is parallel to that of every human being. Since, since it is born and it dies at the same time as he or she does. And anything that harms the integrity of one of them, either the tona or the human, simultaneously affects the other. This is um, uh, something which is very common in Central America. It was called nagualism for some time. And it was considered by anthropologists, in particular, well, for a long time, ever since it was described at the end of the 19th century, as a testimony to the fact that some people did not make clear distinctions between a human and an animal, exactly as was the case with Totems in Australia. So they were considered as two examples of the incapacity to distinguish between nature and culture. Yet, there are at least two reasons why the, common, the commonality of fate between the humans, um, between a human at least, and his or her animal double uh, that is surmised in Mesoamerica is very different from the material and spiritual continuity postulated by the Nonga of Australia between members of the Moites and their totemic birds. First, in Mexico, the animal double is an individual. is not uh, uh, the, the, the representative of the species, and it's born on a certain day, uh, and uh, uh, it uh, is engaged daily in a variety of activities. Not is not a, prototy a, proto a prototype, let's say, as in Australia, which uh, would share uh, abstract properties <coughs> with some humans. Second, in Mesoamerica, a human being does not have the idiosyncratic features of the animal doubles with which he or she is matched and whose nature is often unbeknown to him or to her. It is necessary, on the contrary, for the human being and his or her animal alter ego to be distinguished in essence and in substance, if you wish, for a relationship of analog analogical correspondence to exist between them, and for accidents that happen first to the one to be able to affect the correlate as if by reverberation. Further south, in uh, Upper Amazonia, the same uh, Achuar with whom uh, I did uh, field work grant a place of choice to another bird, the toucan. First, the toucan is the most common type of game, even if its meat is too tough to be really recommended to humans. Like other birds, and like most mammals, the toucan is said to have a soul 
which is similar to that of humans. This feature locates the toucan among people endowed with the same privilege, that is, most plants and animals. It is also owing to this attitude that the toucan is said to conform to the rules and values governing social life uh, among the Ashwa. The toucan is in particular the exemplary embodiment of uh, affinity that humans maintain, maintain, maintain with game, the game animals. Yet, the humanity shared between the Achua and the Tukan, Tukan is the plural, is of a moral nature and not of a physical nature. It's uh, because their <coughs> identical interiorities underpins their, the simil their similarities uh, and that these identical um, uh, interiorities are locked within bodies with clearly different properties. The two can, can fly, can eat certain kinds of fruits, and the humans cannot. They know can feature, whatever, no? So they are attentive rather to physical discontinuities rather than to moral discontinuities the Ashwar and many other people around the world. Um, so what is defining and marking the boundaries there uh, is physical dispositions. So by contrast with the vulture of the autonomy, which is an anonymous singularity, entirely foreign and unknown to the person with, to which it is coupled, by the same destiny, let's say. The Tukan of the Achua is a member of a community of the same nature as that of the humans, and as such, it is the potential subject of a relationship with any entity, human or non-human, placed in the same situation. But the Tukan also differs from the totemic place of the Nunga of Australia, since um, there is no material continuity between uh, the two kinds and humans, and furthermore, as it is believed that it bases its behavior and institutions on the model provided by humans and not the reverse. Let us now turn to the West and consider the properties that Europeans have granted to the parrot. The parrot is no doubt an exotic bird, but also it's a bird whose disturbing abilities to imitate the human voice has for several centuries been a source of entertainment and above all a pretext for a number of philosophical dispositions. Yet, this uncanny ability of the parrot and other so-called talking birds did not grant the parrot the status of it was a human. For a score of great philosophers, among them Descartes, Locke, Leibniz, have argued that the phrases uttered by parrots are in no way a sign of their humanity, since this bird cannot adapt, adjust the impression it receives from outside objects to the signs that it reproduces by imitation. In particular, it cannot invent a language. Which is why, by contrast with humans, it would be incapable of producing a variety of languages. Let us recall that in the Cartesian ontology, animals are purely material beings because they cannot participate a priori in the unextended substance that is the soul. 
And even though this point of view has been discussed and criticized for a number of centuries, still the Europeans, Westerners, if you wish, start historically with the Europeans, carry on spontaneously adhering to this point of view when they surmise that humans are distinguished from non-humans by a reflexive, a reflexive uh, conscience, conscience, subjectivity, the power to signify, the manipulation of symbols, and the use of language through which these faculties are expressed. Westerners, furthermore, fail to question the consequence which is implicit uh, in this postulate. That is, that the contingency inherent in the ability to produce arbitrary signs cause humans to differentiate between themselves by way of the form they give to their conventions and this by virtue of a collective disposition that was formerly called in French le génie d'un peuple, in German Volksgeist, and that we tend now to call culture. Finally, like Descartes, but with a sounder justification uh, provided by Darwinism, Westerners are ready to grant that the physical components of the humanity of humans locates them in a physical continuum within which they do not appear to be a far more significant singularity than any other organized being. Then, if we consider the modern ontology that I have just described as a way, among several others, of identifying and classifying beings according to the properties that we detect in them and not as an absolute standard in relation to which cultural variations must be measured, then the contrastive features that this modern ontology presents in relation to other ontological regimes, they become this feature far more manifest. Faced with a bird of some kind, since it is with birds that we started off, I can assume either that this bird has elements of physicality and interiority identical to my own, but which altogether differ from those that my spouse or my brother-in-law share with another bird. And this is what the Nougat do. And I've called that totemism, of course. Or I can surmise that the interiority of this bird is and its physicality are distinct from my own, even though they display small enough differences to allow for relations of analogy, which is the case of the utopia. And I call this analogism because analogical reasoning is central here. It's analogical reasoning is universal, but it plays a very important part here. Or I can surmise that this bird and I have similar interiorities and heterogeneous physicalities as the actual posit with the tuka and I've called that analysis. Or I can surmise finally that our interiorities are incommensurable and our physicalities are likewise and this is the view that began to prevail in certain circles in the West during the 17th century and I've called that naturalism. So, over and above the relationship to these particular objects, the birds, that I've taken as examples, each of these combinations affords a glimpse of a more general principle governing 
the distribution of the continuities and discontinuities between any human subject and the objects present in it is of her surroundings. Um, on the basis of the resemblances and contrasts of form, substance, behavior, etc., that his or her engagement in the world leads him or her to infer. Each of these modes of identification serves, moreover, as a touchstone for singular configurations of otherness that are as many instituted expressions of more entrenched mechanisms of recognition of the other. However, these manners of detecting and emphasizing fault in our surroundings, I like the word fault which I borrow from Gilles these uh, uh, faults should not be taken as a typology of tightly isolated worldviews, which is a common form, form under which it has been they have been treated in anthropology and the social sciences over the past 50 years. True, I have isolated them after a careful consideration of the, uh, ethnographical, uh, the ethnographical and historical literature. For example, animism as I have just defined it, that is as a continuity of souls and a discontinuity of bodies, is not only typical of the Ajwa or of Amazonian Indians in general, it is most common also in native northern North America, in Siberia, some parts of uh, Southeast Asia and Melanesia, where people end out plants and animals uh, with uh, other um, and other elements also of their physical environment with subjectivity and establish with them uh, uh, all sorts of personal relations of friendship, of uh, uh, animosity, of uh, opposition, of exchange, of seduction, etc., etc. Likewise, analogism is not only a feature of the Otomi Indians or of Mesoamerican native societies. The notion that all beings in the world are fragmented into a multiplicity of essences, of forms, substances, separated by uh, minute differences or minute intervals, that, but that they can be uh, nevertheless, nevertheless coordinated by a dense network of correspondences based on analogical reasoning. This view, this notion, uh, this uh, ontological regime was common in Europe and the uh, second uh, Mediterranean civil civilizations from antiquity to uh, the Renaissance. Uh, and it still prevails in native communities uh, of the Indus, for instance, and in large parts of Asia and uh, Africa. Nevertheless, these ontologies, of these ontological regimes, as you, as you wish, cannot be directly equated with cultures or with worldviews, precisely. I want to emphasize that. Rather, they are the development of the phenomenological consequences of four different kinds of intuitions about the identities of beings in the world. According to circumstances, each human is capable of making an inference in any of these four modes, and we do it all the time. But mostly, a human will tend to pass a judgment of identity according to the ontological context that is the systematization for a group of humans of one of the inferences only where he or she was socialized. So actual ontologies can be very 
close to the model. Animism in Amazonia, for instance, uh, or in the subarctic area of northern North America and Siberia. Totemism in Australia. Uh, analogism in ancient China and in uh, Mexico. Naturalism in the epistemological and philosophical literature uh, of European modernity. But perhaps the most common situation is one of a form of hybridity where a mode of identification will slightly dominate over another one, resulting in a variety of complex combinations. So this fourfold uh, typology should be taken as a heuristic device rather than as a method for classifying societies in boxes. You know? It's the most uh, unproductive way to use it. Um, but it, it is a useful device, nevertheless, I think, as it brings to light the reasons for some of the structural regularities observable in the ways the phenomenological world is instituted and for the compatibilities and incompatibilities between such regularities. And these are two basic anthropological tasks that have been too quickly discarded and thus left open to crude naturalistic approaches. I will now return uh, to my uh, initial concern. How should we conceive the process of composing worlds? It should be obvious that my position excludes both the hypothesis of multiple worlds and that of multiple worldviews. There can be no multiple worlds in the sense of, let's say, tightly sealed containers of human experience with their own specific properties and physical modes because it is highly probable that the potential qualities and relations afforded to human cognition and enactment are uniformly distributed. But once the worlding process has been achieved, once some of these qualities and relations have been detected and systematized. The result is not a worldview. That is, it is not one version among others of the same transcendental reality. The result is a world in its own right, a system of incompletely actualized qualities saturated with meaning, replete with agency, but partially overlapping with other similar configurations that have been differentially or differently actualized and instituted by different actors. And all these fragmentary actualizations, including the highly personal ones of great artists or, or psychopaths, are variants or partial instantiations of potentialities that have never been and will probably will never be fully integrated in a single unified world. As a dream of perfect totalization, full-fledged realism seems out of reach. As for relativism, on the other hand, it's easily attainable, but self-defeating, since it presupposes the universal background of which each person would be a partial. Rendry. So at first glance, these partly overlapping worlds appear to condemn us to live in solipsism, perhaps even in political despair. 
once we forfeit the reassuring consolation of universalism. For faced with similar situations, not every fragment of humanity will ask the same questions. Or they are, at least will formulate these questions in such different ways that other fragments may have difficulty in recognizing in these questions the very question that they themselves has, have set out to elucidate. And this induces massive mismatches usually labeled in anthropology cultural misunderstandings. Now most of these questions may be grouped as problems with expressions will take different forms depending on the ontological context in which they arise. If one accepts that the uh, distribution of the qualities of existence, existence, T-E-M-T-S, not existence, B-C-E, uh, of things that exist, if one accepts that the distribution of the qualities of existence varies according to the modes of identification that I've just uh, sketched, one must also accept that the cognitive regimes, the epistemological positions that make those, regime, those regimes possible, and the resulting manners of tackling the problem will all vary to the same degree. It thus renders our sphere of praxis far more complicated than what the usual opposition between universalism and relativism had led us to expect. Likewise, each of these modes of identification prefigures the kind of collective that is suited to assembling within a common destiny, the various types of beings that it distinguishes. If we pay attention, close attention, to the diverse ideas that people have forged concerning their institutions, we are bound to notice that they seldom result in isolating the social domain as a separate regime of existence with precepts that would only govern uh, the sphere of human activities. In fact, not until naturalism reached maturity did a body of specialized disciplines take as their object the social domain and consequently undertook to detect and objectivize that field of practice in every part of the world and we can't regard for local concepts just, just as if um, its frontiers and contents were everywhere identical to those that Westerners had faced for it. So far from being the presupposed basis from which everything else stands, sociality on the contrary, results from the ontological work of composing worlds to which every mode of identification leads. So sociality is not an explanation, but rather it's what, what needs to be explained. And if up until recently, humankind did not operate hard and fast distinctions, in the natural and the social, and did not think that the treatment of humans and that of non-humans were to be divorced, then we should regard what we usually call societies and cosmologies as a simple matter of distributing existence in different collectives. What or who associates with what or whom where, in what way, for what purpose, etc., etc. Asking these kind of questions and 
trying to answer them implies that the conventional tools which the social sciences have inherited from the European political philosophy of the 17th and the 18th century have to be divested of their centrality and paradigmatic clout. All these tools are a direct outcome of a highly unusual reflexive account of a highly unusual historical circumstance, which is the emancipation of progressive emancipation of European countries from the ancien regime, uh, the political ancien regime. At the time it was produced, these accounts, these accounts both captured and fashioned the peculiarity of the kind of collective within which the moderns felt they were bound to live. Again, among the European elites of the 18th century, let's say, period of the Enlightenment. But it has, it has become obvious, even in the West, that the account is no longer opposite to the multiple rolling states we live in and to the urgency of the impending ecological doom. What is at stake here is the whole conceptual framework through which we deal with what is usually called the social and political organization of collectives. The messianic regime of historicity that we Europeans have imposed upon other very different ways of dealing with the unfolding through time of a common prospect and the basic notions by the means of which Westerners buttress their thinking about why humans are distinctive and how they implement differentially this distinctiveness notions such as nature, culture, society, sovereignty, production, history, art, etc. I could go on for a long time. All of this patiently constructed greed will have to be, if not wholly discarded, for it expresses a specific anthropology, modern anthropology, in a very philosophical sense, not in the sense of a specific science which deserves to be taken into account, alongside with others, but at least demoted from its imperial position. It is time then that the social sciences take stock of the fact that worlds are differently composed. It is time that they endeavor to understand how they are composed without automatic recourse to the Western mode of composition, which is time, more generally, that we, humans, and perhaps some non-humans, or many non-humans, depending on uh, uh, openness, uh, more generally, that we, citizens of the Earth, set out to recompose these worlds so as to make them more amenable to a wider variety of inhabitants, human and non -human. Anyone? 
this. Okay, then uh, otherwise we can uh, start with the discussion first and then uh, come back again. Okay, so let me here now uh, introduce our uh, to this question. The first one, um, Professor Ajahn uh, Thanet Wong Yanawan, uh, he is the director of the master degree program in government uh, of the Faculty of Medical Science at Thammasam University. Uh, he has taught for uh, he has taught social and political theory for more than three decades as an associate professor before retiring recently. He has also taught anthropological theory at the Department of Anthropology at the Faculty of Archaeology at the Sinopakor University for more than a decade. Educated at Jalalongkorn University, University of Wisconsin Madison, USA, and Cambridge University. Has become one of the most famous Thai specialists on social theory, especially postmodernist studies. So please welcome Professor Tane. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this program, and I'm so delighted to give another comment to Professor Bescola, and I'm sorry to repeat some of it that side made this remark in Chiang Mai University a couple of days ago. To start with, I want to map in his thought in the current uh, world situation, because I think that he's not the only one who attempted to do this kind of thing. There are so many people that uh, scholars are trying to do this kind of thing. So I will start with, I have to read because my English is not that good, so I have to read the paper. Critique, I would say, is an attempt to discontinue oneself from the structure of the past and the present. With Marcus Gabriel, the new generation of German philosophers state why the world does not exist, he wanted to detach himself from the present structure of knowledge. And then he had caught the idea that there is such a thing as the world in its entirety, in particular, very early on in Greek philosophy, come to be understood as the view that there are over our principal law governing everything there is. This is the birthplace of the notion that there is a universe and that universe is governed exactly one set of law. Against this background, humanity has been trying to figure out what exactly those principles were, because insight into this principle promised them some kind of on this side. And I think that this is what Professor Descola trying to do the same. Many decades before Michael Scabio, Philip Descola produced a seminal work beyond nation and culture. Descola challenged one of the binary opposition of the Western structure of thought, specifically nation and culture. This world is so dense and intense intellectually, so it cannot be schematized as an anthropological world arising from the free world only. Marshall Salim put this kind of work in the trap of a quote of big time thinker called Levistov. Salim remark conveyed the hidden message of the difference between American and the French mode of thought, particularly in anthropology. Cambridge historian of ancient Greek science, as historian of the ancient Greek science, G. R. Loy, whose work on the comparative studies of ancient Greek and China could possibly be regarded as a comparative and ontology as well, which is completely different from him, of course. Take this graph for ontological typology as a model, and it's called a Weberian ideal type, much more than an empirical entity. So there's a gap between the model and empirical rule according to law. For me, the English Channel and the Atlantic divide the tradition of the understanding of ontology between the British Empire system, I would like to make a very good uh, word for this one, and I call it paradigmism. This discrepancy we call the old war between the Althusserian Marxists and the British Marxist historian during the late 1970s and the early 1980s, when the allure of the Althusserian Marxism is so irresistible for the young new left in England. More of the continent, the gap between the modern and the empirical data is not as wide as the Anglo-American scholar thing. And this is the reflection that I talked to 
uh, many Thai and the Porsches when during the last couple of decades. That's why I think this is very important for the Thai modern as well. This collage site, Maurice Godelier, it is his own work because the conceptual part of reality is no less concrete than its material part. Therefore, practice is just an organic totality in which material and conceptual aspect closely interwoven. I'm a person who grew up in Maurice Godelier, so but the new generation of time, the apologies the younger one might not be. In the age of globalization, global history is needed. Jürgen Oster Hamel, with his famous book, The Transformation of the World, A Global History of the 19th Century, which has been admired by Angela Merkel, is the case in point. The world connected the grand comparative studies that augment the understanding of the difference between thought and culture has been divided in the age of globalization. Kenneth Pomeran, the great biologian, China, Europe, and the making of modern world that published in 2000, indicate the trend of the comparative studies in the age of the new superpower, China. To study the other is the mean to understand oneself. The comparative study of ancient Greece and China taken by Tang Zhuyuan, who has been severely criticized in the West, is an attempt to understand, using very broad term, the eccentricity of the West. Following another word by Jürgen Habermas, the standard back part of the West. This is the agenda that I think the Descola also checked. Anthropology is the study of the others. In anthropology, I call comparative anthropology of anthropology. of anthropology is not only adopted by Descola, but also by Eduardo Fibiello de Castro. Anthropology becomes comparative metaphysics. Even metaphysics become comparative ethnology. And this is the big difference between, for me, in his work, I mean only uh, beyond nature and culture. Because for the custom, I think this is a post very post colonial way of thinking. Ontological difference is both politics and association for an ongoing war of the world, philosophical war of achievement. Whereas in Despera and Haji, particularly in left beyond nature and culture, the implication for political engagement is not that vivid. Nonetheless, political Despera and Haji does not maintain the status quo of the four and Haji. The structure of change is that, but that's come in the latter part of the book. Papa Raseda, Boraika, who is a student of uh, Vivera of the Castle. I argue that this for ontology is, I call, imbued, imbued with ideal of stability, therefore transformation by Christianization of animist perspectivist people is needed, so the change could be understood. And this is what I'm going to, to do in this, this uh, discussion. For me, I think the Descola tend to pay less attention to religion, to put it finally, this color model inclined towards secularism, which is for me a very French secularism. From Jean Pierre Bonnon, Marcel de Pierre, Pierre Videl Marquet, the French anthropological approach to the study of the Greek and the ancient Greek thought, as said by G. R. Loy, the way to understand what human can be understood through the relationship that man is standing between God and animal. Can did this relationship sustain in the age of anthropocene or capitalocene? Now I come to this part of the world. I'm not an anthropologist, so I don't have the data to say much except this country. The word natula in Latin means born. Natula, delighted from natus, means born. The Thai word for birth is in, uh, we always say, chata, chati which is, of course, in India. This was imported from India. The word tamata is a Sanskrit word, also mean nature of everything. In Buddhism, niyama also denoted nature. The word nature in Thailand is tamachati or tamacha, the combination of dharma and chati. The word dharma is widely used in Thailand 
with Dharma, the notion of nature cannot be separated from Buddhism. Of course, this is a new thing for me. Everything that is considered good, the word Dharma will be the prefix. Dharma Rasha, the worship king, Dharma Sat, of the Hindu Sanskrit word of Dharma. The word also, the word is also the name of my university. Thamasa University, whose symbol is the Thamaja of the view of Dharma. The view of Dharma as the view of conquest also appeared in the Indian flag. When the term of good governance was imported into Thailand during the neoliberalized regime, during the late 1990s, the th translation of the good governance is Thamapiba. During the turbulent time of politics, the regime of the Dharma was also proposed. In the little of modern Thai state, Buddhism implored everything. Buddhist paradigm covered all Thai of knowledge from science to everyday life. As the Dharma ruled the official worldview and the discourse of Thai, Buddha said this is inevitable. To put it bluntly, Dharma came conquered but not completely. Dharma is the condition of the relation that is bound ethically oneself to everything within the cosmological order. The word Chata, as I said, means birth within the advent of the Thai nation state. Cha has been associated with the Thai nation state. Although the word Chata could be joined with any other word, Chatma, <laughs> or the quality of the dogs who birth is different from human, is also applied. The word chakma can be a, can be used as a bad word for downgrading someone. Dog, of course, does not have the same status as man. All of the animals are classified as delachan. In Pali language, delachan means the body that goes parallel with the ground, while human being is elective. Delachan that go against the elective means that it cannot attain the one. The ability to attain the one that shows the hierarchy between man and animal. Human beings are on the top of the chain of being, so it's a privilege to be born as a human being. Nonetheless, beings are all constituted in the same cosmic order. Tama, therefore, human being is part of this cosmic order, where human being is not an exceptional being, except he's on the top of the chain. Dharma is a destiny or physical and ethical condition of the world. The power of the teaching of Dharma is also represented in the form of Singha. It is not a be or be only. Huh? Once the word Chati joined the word Dharma, Buddhism undoubtedly, as I emphasized, played an important role for the understanding of the nation in Thai society. For many educated Thai, Dharma is equal to nation. This is for me is a new concept. The Buddhist Buddhists also accept this kind of understanding. Dharma as a <coughs> an ultimate order, as I already indicated, is supremacy. Therefore, respect, obligation, and obedience are inverted. As the top of the chain of being in nation, Dharma requires human beings to have the moral obligation towards the other. The word nature in Thai, therefore, cannot be separate from ethics. Nature is, is ethical concept, ethical conducts of being. But ethics, in terms of Buddhism, is not the historical product of human creation. Tamachat. In Tamachat, the state of ethical relation of the world and that being make no distinction between culture and nature as the scheme of Western nationalism. The opposition of nation and culture due to desperate, but called hard to find outside the European language, do not appear to have experimentally desmontable, desmontable cognitive tests. Without this, this distinction, there is no cultural invent, intervention. Interestingly, the word culture type that we use nowadays as Watanata is also important from the land. This has been translated into Thai in various forms, as for example, Kritikam, and eventually 
วัฒนธรรม which is we currently use it is appear around in the 1930s period, the early 1930s. But the idea of v a t a n a t a n as cultivation of the DNA started in around after second, the first world war. Sorry. Anyway, the word v a t a n a t a n is doesn't mean culture in an anthropological sense. It means in the sense of Matthew Arnold culture and anarchy in an anthropological. Sense. The word "vatadatta" conveys the sense of supreme way of life, much more than just simply way of life. Because w a t a d a t this d e n s i t y progress, generally normal human being hardly had a chance for unilinear progression. Human being, as one of the constituent of t a m a c h a birth, aging, and death are inevitable. Birth, aging, and death are the biological process. During the funeral service in Thailand, Buddhist monk w i l chant, going without returning, sleeping without waking, no l i s no l i no, 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 no resuscitation, and that's all inevitable. Basically, immortality is the fact of being, the law of impermanence. Is what one need to be aware of, so that one can avoid attachment to the ownership of oneself. Of course, the incarnation is the metaphysical foundation of Buddhism. The quality of birth is different. One that laughs when he or she was born indicate that he or she was from heaven, which is very unlikely that we all come from hell, because all of us climb. When we were born, to be born or c h a n t i n g is the path to suffering. Giving birth s h o w physical pain. When death comes closer, closer, physical pain and suffering emanating from various form of illness, s t o c k cancer, etc., etc., etc. Which one is that? What one can foresee the suffering of life? So the Thai adopting Buddhists would say, no, isn't no illness. Is the greatest fortune. Samsara, the cycle of life and death, d e s i g n a t e t o k a or suffering. Memento mori in Latin is what enlightened human being has to be conscious of the samsara of nature. But all this, as I said, is very very highly educated concept because Buddhism for the Thai in general. Has nothing to do with Thai p i t i k a Of course, Thai p i t i k a has been emphasized by most orators of the 19th century to many modern scholars like who specialize in Thai. It's not a way of life for lay people to practice. Thai p i t i k a written in Pali language, is absolutely inaccessible for the Thai person, for a lay Thai person. The translation of many volumes of Thai p i t i k a in To Thailand, which was finished in 1999. History of the understanding of Buddhism in Thailand, based on the oral tradition of the c h a t a k a and of course magic. Although the Vana is the goal of Buddhism, among average Thai, attaining the Vana is not in his or her dictionary. Reincarnation is widely accepted. Of course, life is so fragile. The vulnerability of the s u f f e r life is i n d i v i d u a l Therefore, protecting oneself from this fragile life is desirable. Making a living in the jungle one needs protection, both weapon and magic. Dendrophobia might be the state of modernity, where living in the city means that jungle or something that one left behind. However, jungle is not as adorable as being portrayed by. Those romantic people. There is a proverb in Thai, k a o t i n d a r u n p a Going to the jungle do not forget to bring the source of the knife. Jungle is t h n which also means illegal, uncivilized, fierce, ferocious, and violent, etc., etc. Jungle and mountain are full of spirit. 
from mountain to big tree, all of them are the size of the spirit. Mountain is generally a place for many major spirit. Mount Mary of Hindu mythology is so wide for the time it is cosmology, but it's so far away to have an immediate impact. Mountain, of course, is where the deity live, Jokok Kun Tak, the deity who resided on the mountain ranch that separate Chiang Mai and Nam Tan is well known in the north. Big tree is also where the spirit live. Hapua Odorata or Tonta Tien in Thai is the case in point. And also the people justify themselves that good people will be protected by spirit. Magic is still the means to protect oneself from external power, regardless of form, element, or inanimate object. Protection is one of the reasons in this part of the world, apart from exchange. Everybody needs protection because every being is not born equal. Every spirit is unequal. According to Buddhism, being born as human beings is very difficult because the good karma only contributed to the reincarnation of human being. All beings live in accordance to the hierarchy of karma. Mm -hmm. To be reincarnated as a human or animal depends upon one karma. So vulnerability is the facts of life that show that no one is in, in, invincible. In the northern part of Thailand, particularly around the border of Thailand and Cambodia, when one is six, one probably go to see the, witch, the second doctor who exercises magical power. This you might call witch doctor in a Western sense. The second doctor generally exercises spirit, for example, people, the spirit that possesses a person, as is well known in various regions of Thailand. However, the two types of the doctor, the second doctor, they have the good one and the bad one. And the good type of magic is called Mortam, or the Dr. Dharma. The combination of the word for the doctor is more, okay? or the doctor and the dam. Mortal dam tam designate the domesticating of the local spirit by means of I call it Buddhization and as well as animalisticization of Buddhism. So for among the local people, there's two things that be separate. When you study magic, one need to have a partner. The one who uses black, black magic must have a partner who also has the ability to ex exercise the black magic and vice versa. Magic is trained in the time of Buddhist order. That's why when you do a Kuban talk, you have to exercise, you have to practice, do the chanting in the, in the Buddhist temple compound. So, as I said, Buddhism and magic cannot be separated. The process of sacralization of the dead infant needs to be done within the parameter of the Buddhist temple. <coughs> Generally, the second man in the northeastern part of Thailand is trained as with the Cambodian second doctor. And among the Thai people, we are, we are widely accepted magic, the good one, the bad one was trained by the Cambodian, by the command. And I think this is very interesting for me because we and Cambodian do not get along very well. That. <laughs> okay, that's that's uh, that's the one of the last thing that I, that's I would like to address and this thing. When the spirit is on depression. For the rule of the jungle, there are animals that are prohibited to hunt. Elephant, turtle, vulture, gecko, earthworm, millipede, and especially snake, which has been known for its art and or bad odor. Those animals can be eaten if the rule was broken, bad things will occur to anyone who is directly or indirectly related to the person. And I think this is quite similar to American Indian, American Indian in Latin America. Generally, female spirit play an important role in Thailand. Though territorial based, 
make the power larger than the meter. Menar Pakano, whose name indicated it in the Pakano area, which is not so far from here, <laughs> apart from the marginal status, did the severe politics in Southeast Asia. Salim worked on Stranger King in this article. The kingship and the authority of the Stranger King is based on the power of the female deity who controlled the mad kingdom. Female power, of course, is rather than limited. The big god is needed. The Hindu goddess, the Hindu god, of course, play an important role in the relationship between man and nation. All sorts of Hindu god appear in the Siak, uh, the, the intersection lot of some anti nine of them. And among all these things, we have to understand that Thai society among the person. Of course, we, we talk about the sciences, that's another story. Party local is very important for the elite, but for the person, is not a local. Her, bar, her house, you know the house of your wife, okay, my wife, or his wife, or his wife. Her house and its compound indicate the female power. Meanwhile, her husband who moved into her compound become the groom known as Chao Bao. Bao is mean servant. Okay, that's for the time. So basically, you move to a woman's home to become a servant. <laughs> the ancestral spirit of mother from the mother female pain is important. Of course, I'm not talking about patilineality spirit as such, but of course, patilineal spirit is important. Okay, and this is one of the things that I would like to say for from my perspective that uh, Professor Dunn, if I look at the, uh, the idea of the uh, animism that uh, Professor Descor uh, trying to espouse, I think that uh, it's too secularist and lack of gender. Because for us, animism is a female spirit, mainly. Thank you. Uh, Professor Descola's work uh, 
it's, it's my like my interest interest current interest in the uh, digital anthropology, and then uh, I came across the word ontological terms like uh, many times, and then uh, like from time to time I have to encounter the works that refer to uh, Professor Descola's works. So uh, rather than kind of comments or even uh, any kind of like applications of his ideas, I, I would bring up uh, a set of uh, questions that I try to struggle myself to understand and look for uh, Professor Descola's advice for uh, being more understanding of what you have been doing. So I have three sets of puzzles that I uh, I like to pose here and then uh, see if anyone or Professor Descola yourself can uh, give me some advice to to uh, make further that understanding. Uh, one is the puzzle on. Uh, Maybe I can call it ontology, but uh, at least I, I would rather call it, for now, theories, question of theories. Second is the question of epistemology, or rather, or rather more like methodology. And the third one is something like applications, or to put it, if you will, in a more advanced way, uh, I would call it praxis. So theory, methodology, and praxis. On theory, uh, to my understanding, well, when people put, oh, this is how I, I try to situate this last work among those who has been put under the, the title or under the press of ontological terms. For example, you know, the, the Castro or even rural tools, and then uh, including probably the list and category, and see how uh, like uh, works of each contribute to each other, and in uh, in the same, at the same time how they differentiate themselves. So, to my understanding, I think it is very uh, interesting or very uh, very surprised to me that. When people talk about ontological terms, uh, we see uh, Vivier, Vivier de Castle and uh, Philip Nestor on the sides of uh, one who deal with nature and culture. But on the other side, mm -hmm. I, uh, I think people put Latou and many others under the title, under the name of uh, science technology studies. And then uh, I don't know how I can understand both in in terms of putting them together under the title, under the uh, terminology of ontology or, or ontological terms. Because on one side, uh, people like the Castro and and uh, Philip Descola who talk more about the way to, well, I like your words, the this style of worlding, like the way to. Uh, to live and to encounter to uh, to get along with the nature in different different ways to, to get along with the nature or not uh, it depends on, on how how people practice on uh, the way of living but anyways that is one side but on the other side uh, we see the works of like Batu and even a lot of uh, examples uh, that that was like uh, discussed by Deleuze and, and Gattery in the Southern Plateaus that drawn so much from uh, science, natural science studies. So to me, uh, how 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 would you situate your work within this kind of uh, discussion? So, but to me, I think uh, the works of Deleuze and Gattery most of most of the the examples that he he discussed would would really uh, close to what you frame it as analogism, which 
I'm, I'm not sure if, if, if it is uh, correct or not, but uh, that is what I what I, I understood. But then, uh, on the other hand, uh, it is through natural science, I guess, that Ladu understand non-human. I mean, not like uh, when you, when you said uh, it seems like naturalism is the way to divide culture and nature in in uh, in the way that it cannot be able to make one get beyond humanism and go to post humanism. So I don't know. Just please help me on, on this. That is the uh, questions on theories. Second is on uh, epistemology or what is rather smaller, which is more like methodology. Well, when when we were reading works on ontologies, one of the questions that comes up is is that how can human cross the uh, boundary to, to understand what is non-human right? and uh, vice versa. Or then uh, how can we, we know that the at, the at the place where we encounter we, how we understand each other or how we interact with each other or whether or not it, it is still the, uh, the way that we think about uh, human is itself still a human way of thinking about the other. So uh, on Descartes' works, I think, as he relies so much on uh, the world, well, I like the way you put it that it is, it is not uh, ethnography, but it is anthropology, and then uh, it seems like the responsibility of being an anthropologist is more than just being an ethnographer. But then, uh, when we do such kind of work, then we have to rely on works of others and others and others, which means uh, it has uh, uh, the probability, the problem of translation in many in many sense. Uh, at first, at least in terms of linguistic uh, translation in terms of the, the language barrier itself and then also more than that the ontological translations and then how can we feel like how can you assure that one can understand others through these barriers of translations whether it is uh, linguistic or or ontological. Uh, so then, how how we can understand the Keiko from the point of view of the Keiko, and how we can, if I ask, if I uh, if I am in face to face with Lato, I will ask how we can understand Keiko from the perspective of the pit table, which I, I I seem to to have some ideas how. To understand uh, chairs or tables or objects, and then I, I think still it through the uh, human relations that put into the objects that's what he uh, he made the points. Which I'm not sure if, if it's wrong or not, but this is what I understood. Latu. But then, how would you understand? How would we follow? They still like to then understand other way of other style of building, uh, and then how can we ensure that we really understand it? Third, practice or uh, application. Uh, I have to frame this very well, otherwise I will, uh, I can. I can be in prison. Uh, well, I think Ajahn Tanya already mentioned the, the way that Thai people still still live with otherness. Uh, if, 
if you will, if we can still use this word. Uh, how can we? How do we live with with the? How do we like uh, put different things in hierarchies? How do we put like animals and human beings and also spirits into hierarchy? But as we as we are sitting here, well, behind a totem and in the university that just uh, like put a case of a student who try to raise the questions of a totem uh, whether we can be a university of reasonings of like rational reasons uh, instead of being kind of like uh, uh, animistic or totemistic kind of university. Then uh, I uh, am worried that the kind of the kind of idea that being inspired to <coughs> Western philosophers that lots of times it uh, bring like sharp <coughs> critical ideas to Western philosophy itself when it becomes used by uh, scholars or it become ap ap applied to uh, countries outside of the uh, European countries which is like which is the place where rationality become predominant but for us we ask for rationalities democracy and ras rational rationality is not has has not been uh, established in these countries so then how can we uh, balance or how to put it like the the politics which I believe that for lots of people has been criticizing uh, this class work that it has no politics or like uh, we are, uh, the castles has also been have to uh, has been criticized as uh, like like a, a political kind of philosophies but to me it is very uh, political in, in the sense that it raises the questions of uh, the like uh, the the dominant roles of of science the dominant roles of what you call like naturalism become like, uh, so powerful it's too much then we should balance it with other things but on the other hand on the other side of the world and then I I just learned that uh, Descalas cite lots of uh, work uh, examples from uh, refer to a lot of examples from Southeast Asia and then as you can see we are living in the world of like animism and totemism then we look for some things that is more rational and then how would you suggest us on this kind of practice? Thank you. So now, Mr. Descola, I have both our criticism and questions. Would you mind respond to this? Well, thank you to uh, Professor Tanner and Professor Dupti for these very uh, enlightening uh, remarks and questions. Um, I'll try to synthesize my answers uh, and address at the same time most of the topics you, 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 you mentioned. Um, I'll start perhaps with the, the, the question of the uh, ontological term. Uh, it's, it's a word I've never used myself, so I've been lumped into the, uh, the, 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 the people who are associated with the ontological but I never claimed any, any responsibility in this term. Uh, people that have seen in what I have done uh, elements of uh, shift, paradigm, if you wish, uh, in, in, in that respect, but I, 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 can't, I don't see myself as a guru uh, uh, ontologist. Um, it's true that I've been using this word ontology for perhaps about two decades now, so I, 
Um, and there's a, there's a, a, a recent book on the ontological term, which we have seen by uh, uh, Martin Albright and, uh, and um, what's the second one? Uh, uh, Peterson. Yes, Peterson. Peterson. Um, where I've taken sort of road, but I'm, I think consider that I'm not properly, uh, but that I, I started it perhaps, but I'm not properly in it. But it doesn't matter. So it, it's, it's, not, it's not really important. Um, um, this topic. What is perhaps more important is what you mentioned in terms of the, uh, both of you mentioned that in terms of the, the general uh, configuration of people who are uh, in the social sciences now uh, uh, developing uh, uh, theoretical frameworks that differ from what had been done before in some respects. And perhaps the, the, the first thing would be to state more clearly the difference between, on the one hand, it was the and, uh, Castro and myself, and Bruno uh, Latour on the other. Uh, both of them, I, I must say, are very old friends, and I've been discussing with them ever since, uh, for decades. Um, uh, the, the, I think that an initial difference is that, uh, obviously, it is a question of object. Uh, we, we, in our discussions with uh, with, with Bruno Latour, uh, he always said that I knew nothing about the modern, and I think he knows nothing about the non-modern. And, uh, and so he is specialized, of course, in STS. Uh, and what I find interesting is that although we come from very different uh, uh, fields, and, uh, uh, we've we've we've, we've rather on parallel lines, but there's something where we differ. We, 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 we are both, you mentioned Deleuze and Batari, you mentioned, uh, you could have mentioned someone who was, I think, extremely important also for us, uh, who is not perhaps as well known, which is Grémas, a uh, sociologist, a French sociologist. So we were influenced both by this configuration of authors, uh, uh, I personally am more, I, 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 uh, what interests me in Deleuze, perhaps, less than the, the, the books that you wrote with Guattari, or the books that Guattari wrote with Deleuze, with Plateau, etc., is a very interesting book which is not as well known because I don't think that's been translated into English by Deleuze, which is uh, um, Empirisme et Subjectivité, which is a book on, on Hume, a very interesting reading of Hume. And uh, if I had to define, if I was pressed to define my general philosophical and epistemological position, I would say that I, I, I am very much on the side of the reading of Hume by the This is to close the, the, the parenthesis. But the, the main difference is not so much a difference of object, or the, the, what we know about but the difference that uh, Vivian de Castro and I are structuralists. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Bruno Gatto is not. And so in order to develop his own general model, he, he, he has developed with, uh, with, uh, with Canon uh, this, what is known now as end theory, actor network theory, which, which is in fact very closely linked again to semiology and to the mass. And it is the idea that the, uh, 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 the analysis of the kind of object is interested in uh, is, is the, the first that the actors, or rather that in semiological terms, the actors, that is any agent that is endowed with an agency, so it might be a human or non-human, in that, in, and in that, in that we, 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 we agree, you know, um, that the um, agents or the actors have to be understood along the line of how they, the, they construct the objects of which they are part. And so this is a great revolution, I should say, in STS studies. 
by contrast with precisely what was being done before uh, in the STS studies where, mm -hmm. and this is where the ontology comes in, in the sense that there is not a transcendental reality of phys physical objects that the sciences are studying and then different ways to relate to these physical objects through those and to the social construction of reality, which was the standard view of STS, but that each time you have to build the connections between the actors in order to provide the intellectual tools to understand the global situation. This is how we were to start. The Verde Castro and I, perhaps because, uh, certainly, <laughs> not perhaps, certainly because of the intellectual influence that the discourse has exerted uh, in the study of uh, Amazonian people, uh, we start from a different, uh, from a different uh, uh, paradigm, let's say, which could be defined very, when, when I'm being asked what, what structuralism is about, it's very simple. Is that we we are take, we we are dealing with differences, and these differences. What is important is not how is not how things are uh, similar or related. It's, it's things how things are related through their differences, and this uh, of course can be implemented in a number of ways, which allows me now to perhaps answer another question or query: uh, the difference uh, between. Uh, if you have the customer now, especially recently, uh, if you if you look on his uh, the book that has been tra translated into English uh, under the title uh, uh, Cannibal Metaphysics, which was initially written in French, uh, the what uh, the the Castro intends to do in this book is as as is to decolonize the concepts. Of anthropology. And he does that by building a sort of philosophical war machine, very much influenced by Deleuze and Bagari in this case, um, which is based on this idea of perspectivism, that is, that, uh, which is very common in Amazonia, uh, uh, not universal but common. So the idea that each agent, let's say, or each agent, uh, see uh, others. Uh, in a different way than the others see uh, it. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a, a world of multi-perspective, it's, it's a Leibnizian or a world, you know, a Nietzschean world for which. And what what uh, de Castro has attempted to do in, uh, in his late work is to transform this into a sort of meta metaphysical monument as a war machine against uh, Western metaphysics. One of the problems I see in this attempt, which is not new, I mean, uh, the, the, we have a series of examples, but one is probably not very well known here, by uh, 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 a Belgian uh, philosopher and priest called uh, uh, Bent Metaphysics which is a similar attempt, but on, based on, 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 the, on the, the knowledge that this missionary had of the Bantu in the Congo. Uh, so there's been cases, even perhaps the, the Jesuits, you know, the, 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 the writing of the Jesuits uh, uh, in China, the French and Italian Jesuits in China, which in fact, in, in, in a way, uh, and this is why they, they've been chastised by the Vatican, is, um, is, is an attempt at uh, giving an account of a, an entirely different philosophical world in terms of Western, using Western concepts. And it has been very important because, as you know, Leibniz, for instance, traces uh, his, 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 some of his ideas to his reading of the Chinese, of the Jesuit version of Chinese philosophy. So it, there's been an attempt like that. The problem I see, and in, in the case of all these attempts, 
that are in some cases an anti-date of departure, uh, is that they decontextualize the statements uh, and reconstruct them into uh, a, a metaphysical dispositive, which, of course, uh, um, transforms it completely uh, in the sense that the basis for my description of anonymism or, or the, the, the classical definition of perspectivism are things like dreams that I was uh, 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 we commented upon in, uh, before alone in the houses of a mental space and to a woman who is addressed to a uh, sweet potato. These are not uh, equivalent to the uh, posterior analytics of Aristotle. They, they, they have a very different intellectual status, no? Uh, in terms of text, in terms of, of, of scriptural matter, let's say, no? So in that sense, uh, uh, there is as much a transformation in order to render accessible this kind of metaphysics by transforming it and presenting it as a sort of philosophical corpus in the Western tradition uh, than there is perhaps in what I've been attempting to do, which is based on the idea, a very structuralist idea, which is the idea of the group of transformation. So this, 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 uh, this ontological uh, group of transformation uh, is based on the idea that none of the four uh, Formulae, uh, uh, eight, not any of them dominate or predominate over another one. So in that sense, naturalism is one of the variants of a group of transformation, of a structural group of transformation, as are the others. So perhaps, what, what is the in, in what sense is it uh, is it not entirely satisfying? Um, in the sense that it's not completely symmetrical, but in one, in one very simple sense, that it's based on a kind of universal knowledge, which is, uh, which is a, a, a characteristic feature of the modernist project. No? That it's based on uh, uh, the knowledge acquired from the world of the, And this is, of course, quite specific of the modernist project. So in that sense, it's not symmetrical. But none of the other projects are symmetrical because symmetry cannot be attained, I think, for, 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 for structural reasons. So it's a different way to decolonize by not granting one other formulae a major, a major uh, weight, which is, uh, which Um, which, which, which allows me to come to a question which was addressed in both of your, of your comments, which is how can we move from uh, uh, the uh, within this universalist project, not in the sense of traditional universalism, but based on the universalist knowledge that is on the knowledge which in, in, uh, attempts to make some sense of a great, great number <laughs> of, uh, of uh, local uh, interpretation variants, whatever etc. How, how are we sure that we do not uh, misrepresent uh, 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 well, by using the ethnography, of course, of others? How are we sure that we do interpret, interpret these ethnographies uh, uh, seriously? I think a very, a very basic thing that I think most anthropologists will, will agree with me, when I made a stark difference between ethnography or ethnology on the one hand and anthropology on the other, there is still one thing which is very important, is that the fact that most anthropologists, or I think all, have done a similar concern. So that when you read a monograph, when you read an article, when you read any account uh, uh, by an uh, um, ethnologist, you know, because you've done the same, exactly what are the procedures through which 
the knowledge that this person has acquired in a specific place has been uh, filtered, uh, transformed, and uh, uh, expressed in an accountable way for the public. Because we have done the same. We have had exactly the same experience in other parts of the world. So we can gauge, we can assess, I think we anthropologists very clearly the, the kind of uh, the, the, the validity and, uh, and the, uh, of, of the uh, ethnography of uh, others. Of course, I mean, we, we have to confine in what we get. But, uh, and I, it's not only, uh, I mean, it, no one is a universal knowledgeable person, certainly not I. But what, the, one of the interesting things is the contrasts. When I, when, I, when, I, when, I, uh, when I look at the Otomi or the Thai or the, or the Chinese with Kibaro and Amazon and Ice, their features, their distinctive features are much more clear. And this allows me to turn back to Francois Julien. I've, I've read with great uh, interest and pleasure Francois Julien because he has attempted to, uh, an interesting thing which is to use a Chinese concept to sort of pry open the black box of, of, of Greek concepts. No? But when, what I find at another level of differences, that is including Aboriginal Australian or people from Siberia or Amazonia, etc., is that in fact they are much closer to one, what I thought. I mean, the Greek concepts and, uh, uh, and, and Chinese concepts. In spite of, of course, the obvious differences that Francois Julien has, has uh, underscored, uh, and they are much, uh, they are much uh, closer because I think they belong to the general, uh, this general family of uh, 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 ontological family of analogism. And in fact, to, to uh, I, I confess that, that analogism uh, appeared to me as being a. Uh, uh, something quite concrete because I was at the same time re-reading uh, Foucault's uh, Les Mots Les Choses, it's word and text in English, and uh, this, this chapter on, which is called The Prose of the World, which is in fact the different mechanisms that the, that the, that the, that the, 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 the scholars of the Renaissance have, 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 have used in order to connect it. It's a very beautiful analysis of this. And I was reading at the same time the very uh, the classics in, in, in French technology, which is the called in the history of Chinese by Marcel Kane. In fact, I discovered they were very similar. So in spite of all the differences that uh, François Julien had rightly emphasized, there were also similarities in the way that uh, uh, Chinese classical <laughs> Thinking and uh, and the Renaissance had, uh, had, 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 had tried to organize this complex question of how do you render intelligible a word which is composed of a multiplicity of singularities, and so you have to find ways of connecting things, and in both cases they were very similar. So this is how. It's, it's a very, it's a very, it's a very empirical way to proceed, you know, as, as, as the, 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 the thought processes of this kind of, uh, of uh, the paradigm. Um, perhaps a final, I guess a, a final comment. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm the best, uh, the best position to uh, comment on that, but it's, it's a very important question that you get, that you that you mentioned, which is the political one. I, 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 although I haven't published on, on this because I, 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 tend to, tend, I tend to take a long time before publishing things. Uh, <laughs> I've been devoting my uh, courses at the Collège de France for the past three years to precisely these questions, for example, uh, cosmopolitics, which is the politics not in the classical sense of perhaps most of the political science, but how are world composed of human and non-human organized. Huh? And as you mentioned in China, but these worlds are composed of uh, many different entities. Many of them are non-human. So do we 
or do you, because this is, of course, uh, uh, do you need to be modern and then get back to something else or get, or get, uh, or get, get go forth to something else? This is a very important question. I won't answer it for you, uh, because that's a, that's a question that has to be uh, dealt with by, by the time and by other people who are in the same situation. I don't think it's necessary to ask because the, 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 you have the historical experience of, of other people going through the same uh, steps, the same stages. And uh, I, I think what is personally what, I, what I, I'm not uh, self nationalist or I'm not a specialist, but I've read it a bit, but I, I know quite well a few other cosmopolitical regimes. In other parts of the world. And what I find interesting precisely is that they are providing ways of dealing with non humans that are extremely stimulating uh, and which precisely sidestep some of the, of the obvious problems that, uh, uh, that modernism uh, has uh, set for, for itself. It's not, an easy, it's not an easy question because what was brought about by uh, Modernity by by, uh, by the modern cosmopolitics by, by is is uh, is a form of anthropocentrism, uh, which was linked to the the, the uh, Enlightenment, uh, and which uh, brought about uh, well, let's say human rights, uh, freedom, equality, and things like that, to which uh, uh, we are, I think, a number of people are attached, and so. To go beyond that would mean a new cosmopolitics that would maintain some of these uh, uh, assets, but at the same time be more open to the forms of interactions between humans and non-humans. One of the problems, of course, is that, and it's very clear from 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 for someone in, in France, there's been a, France is a, is a country where there is inequality, but where the, the, the discourse of equality is prominent. And it's been so, uh, it's been so ever since the, 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 the French Revolution. Um, and so one of the ways, and it was very well described in your, in, uh, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your description of, of, of Thailand, Cosmology and etc. Uh, one of the ways to integrate uh, in, in what I call analogous regimes are uh, a number of humans, non-humans, deities, uh, moral principles, etc. is like hierarchy. You know? So humans in, uh, in a, at a certain position in the hierarchy, uh, and there are uh, in this hierarchy uh, uh, elements that are under, that are, that are elements that are Uber, etc., etc. Uh, how, our, uh, how are we going to deal with hierarchy if, in fact, the universalist uh, horizon of the Enlightenment precisely is to, deal, is to, is to, uh, is to eliminate hierarchy and uh, differences? This is, I think we are in a very interesting uh, historical moment where we, what we really need is a huge effort of imagination to uh, devise new forms of cosmopolitics precisely, whereby some of the old elements of universalism would be retained because I think they, 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 most of us would, would not accept for the elimination. And at the same time where uh, the, uh, the the sort of ethnic cleansing of the humans, which was uh, the way that uh, uh, modern politics emerged, uh, would be uh, reversed. No? Uh, the, 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 what we call society is a process of an ethnic cleansing of, of non-humans, no? no? which, which happened in the 17th and 18th century, in philosophy first, and then in law. Uh, 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 we've lost a lot by doing this. We've gained and we've lost. So uh, I think we are in a position now which is very similar to the one that was uh, faced by the uh, 
the, the, the philosophers of the Enlightenment in the second half of the 17th and the 18th century, by the, by the thinkers of uh, socialism in the, in, the, in the 19th century, were an entirely new forms of uh, association uh, need to be uh, 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 put forth and uh, imagined and implemented uh, eventually through uh, action. I think we can open up the floor now. Um, we still have some few more minutes, <laughs> not that much. So, um, so anyone that um, you have comments or questions, please feel free. Okay. Yes, please. Because it's 
um, what we would in modernist term define as their uh, uh, cultural influence, that is the way they adorn themselves, their, their tools, their weapons, the, way they, the places they live in, the, even their language, uh, are in fact conceived as in the same way as the, the biological uh, 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 tools of a, of, a, of a natural species, you know, as, a, as a beak, as wings, as, as tails, etc., etc. So the idea of, human, of humankind has no sense at all in the such a setting, you know, uh, because each tribe species constitutes its own uh, its its own uh, self reference, you know. And one of the interesting things of this is that it could lead to a form of solipsism, so I think, because each, each tribe species would be isolated with its own uh, features. But in fact, the, the, great, the, the, the interesting thing about animism is that since they all have the same kind of interiority, there's a general exchange through uh, a general language. You know? So you, you, you are visited by members of a tribe species in your dreams, but of another tribe species, and you can communicate to them. You can you can address their messages, etc., etc. So the, the 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 difference in physicality doesn't mean solipsism because precisely there's a universal intersubjectivity. So in that sense, of course, it goes against any notion that we have of humankind as such, which is of course a new uh, another uh, modernist. Uh, Thank you for your fascinating presentation. Uh, I have maybe a stupid question. Following uh, from the, the other one, uh, I came across the term humanity in Vivero de Castro's work. He, uh, yeah, I'm wrong, please correct me. He said that humanity is a, a quality of or position of a subject that uh, have the maximal opposition to the others. Both human and non-humans, both human and human persons have humanity. So this this struck me very much because I uh, but 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 you mentioned a lot about we shouldn't dis dis distinguish using a particular terms to that. So I just want to hear your reflection on on on, on the use of the term humanity mm -hmm. in his work. I think one would have to distinguish between humanity and humankind. You know? mm -hmm. Humanity is the is 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 a very general description of what we we as modernists uh, think are the general features of humans. So it, in, in that sense it's a modernist concept. And humankind is also a modernist concept but it's it's when it's contained <coughs> among uh, a certain uh, uh, bundle which is composed exclusively of humans. You know? So in that sense, it's. Uh, I think uh, the, 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 when the, in his initial article on, on, on the person quoted a uh, uh, definition which I gave myself uh, of, uh, of how the actual understood uh, 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 humanity precisely. Uh, I said that. Uh, humanity is the default position of any being in the world, uh, but this it differs from humans in the sense of Homo sapiens. No? I can't remember exactly how I, 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 I put it. But, uh, so this is this is precisely. I mean, we have to use concepts that can that are understood uh, by everyone, and so when we speak of humanity, uh, it is uh, this idea that uh, 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 the Tukan or, 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 or uh, the stem of manioc, etc. add humanity in the sense that we grant to this, uh, to this, to this term. So there would be a long discussion because it's been a, a heated, there's a, someone that, that wasn't mentioned among the uh, people in whom we've been discussing this for some decades, it's still in uh, There's been discussion also as to whether and this is something which I, I think I can discuss in John Mann uh, briefly, uh, uh, whether the notion of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, humanity is opposite to describing uh, uh, 
social relations with and between governments in the sense that it's not sort of metaphorical uh, uh, usage of the notion of, of the projection, let's say, which is a very Durkheimian notion, finally, you know, for Durkheim, as you know, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, religion is a society transfigured, and in the same way, the environment is society transfigured. You know, it's a projection of social categories on the environment. Precisely, I think, perhaps one of the, ma the, the, the major defining feature of what is being called uh, the ontological term is an anti durkheimian position in that sense, in that sense, in the sense of uh, uh, it's not the idea that there are social relations that are used in order to understand the environment or, or grant agency to the ATs or whatever, but the idea that the relations that we use in order to think the relations between humans are the same that we and there is no priority, there is no priority, so it's not a projection. No? And I mentioned, but I won't, have to, no, I won't have the time to enter into that, the fact that everywhere, especially in the animist world, uh, the words that are used to define the social relations with non-humans are the same words that are used to define the social relations with humans, uh, as to do with cognitive efficiency. The fact that when I mentioned, for instance, that among the the actual, the the, the uh, 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 consanguinity and affinity were the, were the basic categories through which the uh, relationship with the with the with the plants and the animals were conceived, it's 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 not that it's the projection of the human relations of consanguinity and affinity on the on the plants and animals, but that these are. Uh, uh, very uh, easily accessible concept in order to define specific forms of relation that include both humans and non humans. And I, I, I want to insist on the fact that, in fact, even in the West, in the modernist project, uh, uh, it's very late uh, at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century that uh, the specific concept uh, were, uh, uh, were, were implemented in order to define the relations between uh, uh, between non-humans, or in ecology, uh, parasitism, commensality, all these concepts that are uh, basic in ecology you now are very uh, are very late in the history of the biological of the sciences, uh, uh, in, and uh, so it's well, that's all this. Yeah, so. <laughs> okay, I think. Um we have to come to an end um, because of the time. So uh, now I would like to invite uh, Assistant Professor Darren Wong uh the Director of the Center for Social Study uh, at the Faculty of Pro Science uh, for closing remarks. Please sit Thank you very much, Professor Chakri. Uh, uh, also, on behalf of the uh, uh, Center for Social Development Study of the Faculty of Political Science, uh, I would like, before I say thank you to every participant, may I uh, speak a little bit there. Uh, today is also very important. It's not only the fruitful discussion, but it's the ending series of uh, our work with the ERASEC on the uh, on the series of seminar called Society and Environment in Southeast Asia. This is this project has started since November last year, 2016. So we have people from ERASEC, which is also present here. So uh, this is a start with Abigail and Stefan. So may I would like to ask us to Give a big applause to those who keep on the seminar. <laughs> so without the starting point in November last year, we will not come to this series. This is the ending series. Uh, after uh, Abigail and Stefan on society and environment in Southeast Asia, then we have uh, Dr. Jack Drake, who also our moderator, talking about nature and culture on the modern Thai engineering. So I also would like to thank Professor Jack Kim to keep this on the issue. After that, 
we don't have the speaker here today, but I think we already have a very big discussion during in Chiang Mai, and she is one of the speakers since January. Uh, Dr. Bin Gao, Leung Aram Si, and at that time she talking about the politics of nature conservation. And uh, uh, after that, we also have people from Irasek to involve with our seminar. And from the Chulalongkorn University, we have Dr. Narumon Arunothai, who also talking about the issue of the uh, understanding of the mock mock dance. And lastly, for the seminar, apart from the two-day conference with the ICSD in Chiang Mai, and today we have uh, the final seminar with the uh, talk from the Professor Philip Descola. So thank you very much, Professor Philip Descola. Thank you. And in fact, for me, I learned a lot from our two discussants. I know the discussion for such a long time, and for me, this is the very impressive and provocative. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Associate and Dr. Ney Mugyanawa. So this is for your talk. Thank you very much. And also thank you for Dr. Yuxi. I never see the issue of unpolitical. We have the political manner. So today, so thank you very much for Chan Yuxi. Thank you. This series seminar will not happen without the starting idea from Irasi themselves who come to us. And actually, we work with Irasi for several times. But this is the more fruitful that we work quite a lot. So I would like to thank Claire, our regional director of Eurasex. Thank you very much. And in terms of making it possible, in fact, we work a lot with Abigail, so who are really a key person who made a series seminar is happen. So thank you, Abigail. Stefan, who are not only researcher but also making this issue and make it happen for the whole series of the whole. So thank you very much. <laughs> On behalf of uh, CSDS of Tulalongkorn University, uh, even though we have a lot of intellectual and those who are the engine behind all the talk, but it will not possible with our, our partner or collaborative people who also make us possible. So may I uh, use this opportunity to thank uh, the, the, the RCSD who are also not here, but I would like to use this opportunity to thank the, the RCSD Center from Chiang Mai University. I would also like to thank the Sasa. I think Ajahn Yuti also come here not only as a discussion but on behalf of the Siamese Association of Sociologists and Anthropologists of Sasa. And also the Institute of Research and Contemporary Southeast Asia, so Eric So you are the most uh, work and to make it possible. And lastly, uh, with our support uh -huh, from the French Embassy of Thailand, I would like to give a big applause and thank you for the French Embassy of Thailand who support us for this work, so thank you very much. Uh, for the final issue, uh, I hope on behalf of Tula Longkorn University, we are really honored and really happy that now we can work together for such a long time. And we hope that the uh, cumulative of all the work and the discussion will be happen in the future. And we hope to work with uh, our partner with Erasic and also uh, the people who are in this room in the future. And for us, we think that uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Political Science at Tulalongkorn University, uh, for the coming year, we will have a lot of the project for ongoing. So we would like to invite those who are in this room and also work on the on the issue on the society and environment, and including 
the issue that we debate right now to involve with our work in the future. Uh, for me, this is the not even though it's an ending of the series, but it's not ending of the all seminar. So we believe that in the coming time, in the future, we will have more work that we will do it a series of seminar in the future, or even doing a co-researching on the several issue that we are debating right now. So I think I hope that this is will be happen. So finally, I would like to ask all of us to give a big applause to all participants and to join this seminar today. Thank you very much. <laughs>